Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our CSU Alumni Night In. Amputation isn't the only option. How CSU research is saving limbs and lives. My name is Ryan Janicek. I'm with the CSU Alumni Association. And I understand that these are challenging times for many reasons, but we are happy to have you join us tonight and hope this is a fun and educational webinar for all of you. We are here to build a RAM community and be a resource. And this webinar is one of the many ways we can do that. I want to thank you all for att attending tonight. We had 30 registered, uh, still trickling in, but I can see on our list, we had some alumni members. And I just wanna say thank you to all you alumni members. You help events like this become possible. Um, please feel free to put any questions in the chat. And if you're viewing outside of Colorado, put where you're watching from. I'd like to see where everyone's at. Uh, if you have any problems with the technology or anything, I'll include my contact, cell and email in the, in the chat if you have any questions. Uh, if this is a very interesting subject to you and you want to see what else is going on in the future, um, I'll include future events by the alumni and the Center of Healthy Aging. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight. The presenter is the director of the Columbine Health System Center for Healthy Aging at CSU. She conducts trans translational aging, limb preservation, tissue engineering, and sarcoma research, as well as bone and regenerative medicine to benefit both human and canine patients. She is also de developing diagnostics and testing that is used to fight COVID-19. This is just scratching the surface of all that she's done. And I'm happy to, to welcome Dr. Nicole Earhart. Welcome. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the seminar webinar. Glad to have you here tonight. I hope that you've gotten your evening cocktail in hand so you can relax and just listen and hopefully have some great questions that you can ask. And uh, I just wanna share with you some work that um, is outside of the COVID stuff we've been doing. This, this encompasses probably about 25 years of work. So what I'm gonna do is kind of go uh, an inch deep and a mile wide but into some of the work we've done trying to find alternatives to amputation when people have limbs at risk. And we are doing that through the companion dog because companion dogs also have the same kinds of things happen to them as you can kind of see here in the right hand corner that people do that cause limb loss. So I hope that this is interesting for you and, um, and not too scientifically complicated. It should be pretty um, interesting. I will say that there are some pictures from surgery in here. And there, so there are some, I guess, kind of gory pictures. If you have kind of a weak stomach or you're a little bit queasy with that, I'll try to warn you before one comes up so that you can look away and just listen. Um, and so hopefully that won't be too bothersome for anybody. So we know for certain that when you lose a lot of bone or muscle in an arm or a leg, you are at very high risk for amputation. And the most common reasons that people do lose a lot of bone and muscle are things like trauma. So you can see here this war injury, these explosive injuries, um, cancer, neoplasia. So this is a sarcoma of the bone and you can see the MRI here, and this is actually what the leg looks like. Okay, so it's a tumor of the bone. And the other thing that can cause amputation is infection. And probably the thing that might be most familiar to people here is, for example, diabetic ulcers causing foot amputation. We often um, are dealing with infection, usually as a sequela to um, trauma, um, but there are many other ways that you can get infection in your bone and, and in your muscle that could cause muscle loss or bone loss to the extent where you might have to have your limb amputated. Um, most recently, probably the most common thing that we see are warfighter injuries. And what's happened is that body armor has gotten very, very good at protecting our core and our head. So people survive these explosive incidents like um, you know, explosive devices that happen in uh, battlefields, um, but they have tremendous trauma to their limbs. So the limbs are not as well protected as the core and the head. And of course, if you survive this, then you're left with these injuries that can be extraordinarily um, 
uh, debilitating. And I'm sorry, I didn't warn you about the, the gory picture there. But this is a explosive injury to the tibia of a warfighter. Um, one thing that can happen too, so it's actually easier to put the bone back together. What's actually the hardest thing is to get the muscle to regenerate. And when you lose a big chunk of your muscle, what ends up happening is you exceed the body's ability to heal that defect and it heals by fibrous scarring. It just scars in and this causes diminished function and unfortunately a high rate of disability and it's not very pretty to look at. And the way in which we usually in traditional um, surgery have dealt with large muscle loss is you try to graft muscle from somewhere else in the body. So you kind of borrow it from somewhere and then place it in that defect and hope that the body can kind of do the rest of the job to keep things functional. The problem of course, is that when you have a large enough injury, then you're you know, trying to retrieve that from somewhere in the body and you can actually have a donor site problem. So you only have limited amount that you can bring from one place to another in the human body. Now dogs also um, get limb threatening muscle and bone loss. Um, the gory picture uh, that you see there on the bottom left is an intraoperative picture from surgery where we removed a bone tumor. This is actually the, the plate and um, repair that we did. This is another form of repairing the limb in these large muscle um, or bone defects. Dogs also, if you think about military working dogs, police dogs, just pet dogs, um, do experience crush injuries, think about car accidents or getting run over by a car. The explosive and blast injuries are usually things that happen for working dogs, like military working dogs, and they get infection. But the most common thing that they get um, that causes large amounts of bone or muscle loss is cancer. And the type of cancer they get is sarcoma. And this is involving the musculoskeletal system. Now, some of you may have heard of the um, the term osteosarcoma or bone cancer in dogs. And unfortunately, it's a very common tumor in dogs. Perhaps some of you have heard of this or even had your own pet experience this. Um, and these, this is what happens is they get these large tumors that involve big pieces of the bone. This is this um, area here. And you can imagine, so this is very abnormal. And in order to remove this, you have to remove a very large chunk of bone. And that is not going to be compatible with keeping your leg. Now, fortunately dogs have kind of, we always say they have three legs and a spare because they do quite well with amputation. They don't experience kind of the psychosocial trauma that people do with amputation. But the truth is, is that we can do a lot of the same things in terms of preserving limbs that we can do in people. Um, in dogs. And so sometimes we'll have owners that are interested in finding options to help repair the limb. So my laboratory, so this is the laboratory of comparative musculoskeletal oncology and traumatology in clinical sciences over at the Animal Cancer Center. Our sort of research theme has been limb salvage and I'll explain what the definition of limb salvage is. But what we do is we conduct hypothesis driven research and the point of doing this is to benefit not just humans, but also companion animals that have limbs at risk of amputation from either tumor, trauma, or infection. Now, I said I would share with you what the definition of limb salvage is. And what we're doing is we're doing some kind of surgery, limb preservation or limb salvage is a surgery performed to avoid amputation, but still preserve the patient's best appearance and also degree of function. And this is true whether you're a dog or a, a person. So these are just some examples. This is a person, this is the knee joint, and this is a tumor of the knee joint. This is the prosthesis that they're going to remove a very large section of the femur, which is the thigh bone, and repair it with a metal implant that has also a total uh, knee replacement in, in it. And this is actually an intraoperative picture. So this is this implant placed into that person. And as I mentioned, we can do some of these things in dogs, not quite the same exact things because they have different joint mechanics and other um, special needs, but um, very similar uh, approaches. The problem is, is that this is not a silver bullet. In fact, it's actually a really hard thing to save a limb that has lost a lot of bone or muscle. If you look at limb salvage in people, the average number of procedures per patient is 15 major surgeries. Now this is just to preserve the limb. They have to undergo 15 major surgeries, the average cost just for the surgeries, this doesn't include all the other things like the ICU and hospitalizations is around uh, 675,000. That's actually a low number nowadays. 
And even with the best medicine, the best available uh, infection control, et cetera, the infection rate is still 15%. Now that may sound like not a lot, but when you think about most orthopedic procedures, for example, total hip replacements or cruciate ligament repairs, ACL repairs, the average infection rate across the board in orthopedic surgery is somewhere around 1%. So 15 times higher um, level of infection. And then here's the big problem is that the implants, those big metal implants actually fail about 40% of the time. So that means that either that person's going to have to another major reconstruction with replacement implants, or they're going to have to have an amputation. So clearly we are not dealing with something that we've quite dialed in yet. And yet this is some, so this is a very rich area for research. Now, um, when we think about the unmet challenges in limb salvage surgery, it's interesting to note that the same challenges exist in dogs as they do in man. The problem is, is that the body does not integrate well with, um, the, the body does not integrate its natural bone and soft tissue with these metal implants. It's just hard to get those two things to heal together. And as we said already, there's high infection rates and high implant failure rates. And what this leads to is multiple surgeries, high cost of care, a lot of pain, poor limb use, and unfortunately in a, in a high number of people and in dogs, um, amputation. So clearly we need to do better. We are not where we need to be when it comes to avoiding amputation. The technology just doesn't always match up with the biology. So I'll share with you some deeper thoughts about that as we go. Now, one of the things that happens when we're trying to research how to improve techniques and how to learn why things don't heal well in these large defects is we turn to animal models. And of course, the most common are sort of mouse and rat models. And I'll share some data and research from some mouse and um, rat work that we have done um, but then if you want to translate that into a human population, you need to go to a large animal model and common large animal models that are used for testing, for example, implants and just seeing if they work and if there's any side effects from them, et cetera, are pigs and sheep. Um, the problem of course, is that these are animals where we have to induce the disease. So they don't have trauma naturally. They don't have infection naturally. I mean, they can, but the subjects that are used in experimental projects like this is something where we have to create the defect, we have to create the infection. Um, and so of course that's number one loss of life for that animal um, in these studies. But number two, it doesn't really always recapitulate the, the actual clinical situation where you have blast injuries to soft tissues or you have infection problems. And so what we need is something that's more of a real life model that will help us translate how these things behave in, um, in real life situations um, in order to get them approved for clinical use in people. Now dogs, and, and if you've shared, been to any of my other seminars, you'll know that um, we are very much in, interested in keeping companion dogs, our pet dogs, as healthy for as long as we can. And dogs get the same types of diseases, as we said, and the same types of traumas to their limbs as people do. But in unlike, for example, pigs or sheep that are used in these um, animal studies, these are, these are members of the family. They get excellent health care into old age. And in the US alone, there's a very large population of these animals. And as I mentioned, about 10,000 of these dogs a year get these sarcomas. And so there's a large number of these that we can use as um, sort of examples for how things might go differently or better in people, but yet also benefit the dog, which is, of course, the primary goal. So their diseases de develop naturally, as we said. Um, we don't have to induce infection. We don't have to induce a tumor. They get this stuff naturally. So they need help anyway. And they also are unlike, for example, mice who are essentially genetic twins of one another. These have the same kind of heterogeneity of not only just their disease severity, like bad infection versus more mild infection, or you know, worse explosive injuries versus you know less less severe, they also have the genetic diversity, just like people, right? So, you know, different sizes, different shapes, different colors, et cetera, and even different lifestyle um, situations, like sedentary lifestyles versus a working dog versus a, a couch potato dog. Um, not only that, there's a known genome sequence and. And because their lifespan is shorter than people, what takes decades and decades and decades to study in, in people can be done in a very short period of time in dogs within the lifespan of the dog. And, 
Um, and then they get this great, you know, like I said, they have healthcare things like physical therapy. This is this is a physical therapy in a, um, one of the, our, our patients at CSU. So all the kinds of things that you can do for a patient in the hospital to help them recover and help them re recover their function, we can also do for dogs. And that's not that easy to do in a sheep as an example or a pig. So we just have this opportunity that I think can really benefit both dogs and, and people. And as a result of that, and, and the work of many others, including Steve Withrow, Rod Page, many people that I couldn't even, they're too long to mention, we've, we've really gained a lot of credibility in the FDA because they are now aware of the fact that there's, there's an important role that pet dogs can play in development of different human drugs or biologics or devices um, and they can be inserted in the different parts of the regulatory pathway that it takes to get something approved in human. Not only that, but they also, because they are so good at mimicking human disease and they themselves need the medical care, um, you know, this becomes a kind of a win-win situation. So I'm going to just kind of go through my uh, how to save a limb, the canine version. And what I'm going to do is, is highlight what are the challenges that we've had how have we approached this, um, these challenges? How does this compare to man and the challenges that we've had in humans? And what are some potential solutions? So the first thing we have to understand is, as I mentioned, it's really darn hard to, to reconstruct these large defects. And the question is, why is this? Well, when you think about it, you're taking a very challenging situation like a trauma or in the case of a cancer, and you're asking that tissue to repair a really, really large defect. And we as human beings or as canines have limited re regenerative capacity. Like we all know we're not salamanders and we can't just regenerate a limb once that limb is removed. And that's a function of the fact that our bodies are not as uh, efficient at regenerating really large defects or complicated tissue defects. So as we sort of went through, this is now again, like probably 25 years of work that I'm going to share in the matter of the next few minutes. So bear with me. But, you know, when we started thinking about, okay, well, if we have this big bone defect, how about we just repair it with bone? Like, how about we get bone from a tissue bank? So we, there are actually tissue banks in, in veterinary medicine, just like there are in human, um, the human world. And you can actually get whole bones and other things. These are people these are people's pets that have passed from other diseases and they donate their bodies just like we can be a, a tissue donor when we die. There are uh, services where you can uh, have your own pet be a tissue donor and this is where these tissues come from. They don't come from shelter dogs, by the way, that have been euthanized. So the advantage of using allograft, and allograft again is just a graft of a bone that comes from a cadaver. So it's a large segment of bone that comes from an animal that's already passed and their tissues were donated. It goes through a sterilization process, et cetera. And one of the nice things about using bone to replace bone is that it's kind of the same tissue, right? Like the modulus of elasticity, which is a biomechanics term, but basically it's identical to the host bone, the actual living bone to some extent, or at least to a better extent than most of the artificial things that we use like metal or ceramics and other things. So it's, it's a biologic material. It also um, kind of provides a scaffold for new bone to form. So it sort of preserves bone stock in a way that other substitutes really don't. Um, and we've actually done a lot of work in the, in uh, this has been decades now, um, where allografts have been used in dogs to show that they can actually be used successfully in people. And this was just one study that came out of CSU um, where they were using bone cement inside the, um, the allograft or inside the bone uh, graft in order to help uh, keep that bone graft stronger for longer. So, um, and that, that work, these two papers that came out um, several years ago, basically helped this process get approved in people. And today, this is exactly how it's done. This bone cement is put into these allografts. And that work was first done in dogs with osteosarcoma, with bone cancer. So you can see the potential to change medicine and to help, but also help dogs too. So if you're interested in seeing what a limb salvage surgery looks like in a um, veterinary patient in a dog, this is uh, me and my team doing a limb salvage surgery. And you can see that there's a large team. We have the anesthesiologist, we've got a circulating nurse, we've got different teams scrubbed in to try to help with passing instruments. You can see the degree of sterility that's here with all the draping, et cetera. 
This is not something that can be done in a regular veterinary practice. This is a very, very advanced technique. It requires a very large and experienced and well-oiled machine of a team. And we have a beautiful example of this at CSU. And this is, this is our team. Sorry for the gory picture without the warning, but this is, uh, this is um, the bone being removed that has the cancer. The toes are down here, the elbows up here. This is again, toes now are opposite. Toes are down at the right hand side, elbow up here. And now we're about to put the allograft in. So this is the bone graft. It's been placed in there with a big bone plate that we can help secure everything and keep it stable till this bone heals to the parent or the host bone. Um, of course, that all sounds wonderful, but the truth is that this is, again, highly complicated. So if you look at the list of the types of complications that you see in dogs that get this allograft limb sparing or limb salvage versus humans, what you see are that the things that happen are the same. What is a little different are the frequency of the complications. So in humans, we said 5 to 11% are, are complicated have infection um, in, on the human side, you can see this really high number of infections in dogs. Um, humans have a higher amount of fracture um, and dogs have less amount of fracture, but the list is identical. The frequencies are different. So if you wanna know why dogs um, have more infection problems than people, this is why. <laughs> Human patients typically don't lick their incisions. Dogs typically do. We do have strategies to deal with that. And certainly if there was um, a problem with uh, people um, licking their wounds, we would probably use similar strategies um, as this. So again, these collars to try to prevent self-trauma, not just to um, you know, prevent uh, chewing out of sutures or other things, but to prevent licking, which introduces bacteria. And so that is one of the reasons why we do have a higher complication rate. And this is what an infected allograft looks like. You can see these draining tracks. This is, you know, fluids and pus material coming out. Um, this is what the allograft, so the allograft starts here and ends down here. And I don't know if you can kind of pick up the difference in the density of the white, but you can see how loss of density has occurred at the ends here relative to the parent bone. And when we get this out to revise it, this is what it looks like. So it essentially is this rotten piece of bone that has no structural integrity. And this infection is remarkably hard to clear up. Even when you replace the whole allograft, all of the plate, everything, it's just like MSRA or MRSA in people. It's very, very difficult to clear up. So because of these, we've, we've also asked the question, um, what, what about big metal implants? Then these big metal implants we call endoprostheses. And in people, this is a very common way to, to repair uh, limbs with large segment bone loss or muscle loss. And that there's a nice advantage to this because they're off the shelf. You know, you don't need to get them from a tissue bank. They can be manufactured. They allow early weight bearing. And then one of the nice things is you can also use them in conjunction with a total joint replacement. So in this case, this is a total knee replacement. So this is the actual implant and you see how big it is. Um, and then this is what the x-ray looks like afterwards. But again, big challenges, right? Because limited durability, um, the median time or average time to, the to when you have to have a first revision is five to seven years. In contrast, for example, total hips, which are put in people all the time, average durability is about 15 to 20 years. So this is just a high, more, a lot more metal, a lot more complicated, and there's all kinds of things that can happen. Aseptic loosening, which means loosening of the implant without infection, mechanical failure, the implant just fails, or infection itself. And as you think about it, it's not ideal for patients that are growing. And unfortunately, osteosarcoma, which is the most common bone tumor, both in dogs and in humans, um, occurs mostly in children. And so these are children that are still growing. And if you could imagine, I'm just going to go back here. Um, if you're eight years old with, um, a, you know, when you have your first limb salvage surgery, you will have an eight-year-old size limb for the rest of your life. So they have to be revised like every several years as that human grows. And so that is certainly not ideal for a child to go through many, many surgeries. And in these skeletal, 
skeletally immature people, so children that are still growing, they have 30 plus surgeries that they go through to get to their normal limb length. This is what's available in um, dogs. This is one commercially available option. It's really quite simple. It's not quite, it's not very sophisticated. And quite frankly, it's not all that great of a design, but it happens to be the only place where you can actually get an off the shelf endoprosthesis unless, and so this is what it looks like. These implants come in different sizes and they actually are joined with a large bone plate. And so what you can see here is the bone plate. These are just skin staples on the outside. And here is that big metal implant that goes in there. So it's almost like a strut. Um, and it's not very sophisticated and quite frankly has a lot of complications. Um, we've done some work over the years um, looking at comparisons of these uh, allograft or bone grafts and endoprostheses to try to figure out is there a better way, like is one better than the other? And what we learned is really that they fail about the same amount of time. Um, it's just that they fail differently. So with allograft, which is this bone graft here, what we see is um, failure of the screws usually in the metacarpals or down by the toes. Um, whereas in the um, uh, metal implants, we see failure of the screws up here. Now, I don't know if there's any um, biomechanics people um, on the call, but those of you who are or might know something about this can probably appreciate that the, elast the modulus of elasticity between this very stiff metal and this less stiff bone is probably the problem. And this puts a huge amount of stress on these screws. And so um, that's generally the big issue. Um, now, because of those problems, people, and because there's been so much advancement in 3D printing, we have been doing more and more of these custom 3D printed endoprostheses for dogs. This is an example of one, and this is an example of the surgical um, technique. This is my colleague, Dr. Bernard Seguet, doing a, a surgery where he's using this custom implant to put in uh, to the, um, the patient. I don't think there's a gory slide coming, but there is next, but I think there is one, two slides now, so I'm just giving you a warning. These are some other ideas people have come up with, and there's all kinds of different custom options. You can see this, this is kind of a different, maybe take on it, it's kind of a, a cross between a prosthesis, but this prosthesis goes into the bone, and it has this sort of blade um, option on the bottom, and you can take, diff you can put different type of footprints on there, um, but you can see that the implant kind of translates from from within the bone and then comes out through the skin and then these different um, foot styles can be put on there. And so there's a little Basset Helm with his cool leg. Oh, God, gory picture, sorry, to, this is the gory picture. Um, so anyway, this is this is a complication of one of them. And this in this case, the dog chewed their leg open um, and you can imagine the challenge of trying to reconstruct not just the leg now, but now all this soft tissue. So again, not that there, this always happens, but when it happens, it's a disaster. And so, you know, at the end of the day, what me and others have sort of concluded is, while we can make better and better and more sophisticated replacement parts for bone, a purely mechanical approach is never going to be the answer. Like we need to think of other ways to work with the body because what's happening is we're just sort of putting in replacement parts, but the replacement parts aren't really integrating with the biology of the tissues. And so what we really need is a solution that temporarily relies on intrinsic mechanical strength. So it's strong enough that you could walk on it, but ultimately what it would do is, re is incorporate and rely on the properties of biologic tissues. So in other words, we need to leverage biology, advances in technology and in material science and implant design to interface them to work in concert with the body. And so if you think about this, um, it's really interesting to think about how maybe whatever, 10 years, 20 years ago, we were thinking about this whole replacement of parts idea and that was kind of where the, the field was going. And now instead of thinking about how to replace parts, what we're trying to do is integrate using various advances in, in science and technology like nanotechnology to help integrate those tissues in a better way that's more functional. So what we've been working on is developing these biologic aloe metal hybrid implants to help um, create implants that fit those criteria where they, they temporarily rely on intrinsic mechanical strength, but ultimately kind of reform into the body's tissues. And where we started with this is with stem cells. So for those of you who may or may not be familiar with stem cells, stem cells are, are the repair cells of our body. So they are 
how our adult bodies um, repair themselves when you have an injury. They're kind of the, the cell that starts the cascade of tissue repair. In the skeletal system, both the muscle and the bone, the type of stem cell that exists there, and there are stem cells in all the tissues of our body, but the one that exists in skeletal muscle and bone is something called mesenchymal stem cells. And mesenchymal is just the term for skeletal tissue. So these cells um, actually can sort of divide and turn into different tissues. They can turn into bone cells, they can turn into fat cells, they can turn into cartilage cells. But what we know is that if they're given the right signal, they have been shown to speed fracture healing and um, some small defects in, in bone. And we also know that these stem cells, if you give them, for example, in the vein, like say we get stem cells from either a donor or harvest them from the patient and just inject them in a vein, they will actually find their way to the site of injury. So they have a homing mechanism to get there and then start their repair process. And not only that, they also have abilities to modulate the immune system in a way that fights infection and also diminishes the um, potential for implant rejection. So because of these features of stem cells, we were really interested in how we could use those properties to help um, heal tissues. And we started very simply in the mouse. And this is just some um, pictures of from micro CT. This is a mouse femur bone or thigh bone that had an allograft placed here. And the allograft is from here to here. And when we look at this sort of in a plane that you can see where the um, marrow cavity is, you cannot tell where the allograft is versus where the host bone. You can kind of see that there's some callus here and then you have what we know is allograft because I can tell you that that's where we put it. The reason we got such good healing is because we use stem cells and how we did it in this experiment was we just put those stem cells in a, a carrier. In this case, it was hydrogel. We also used stem cells that were um, expressing green fluorescent proteins so we could find them again. And here are stem cells sort of at this, this is marrow here and you can see stem cells in the, in the area of the um, allograft site. And then we also looked to see how quickly they could go from where we gave them intravenously, how quickly would they arrive at the site where we wanted them to get to. And what we found is by looking for those green fluorescent protein cells, we found them at the site by three days after we injected them. So they took three days to find their way around and then they would accumulate there over time. So that was kind of the early experiments. And then we wanted to see, okay, well, that's where we actually have, we've replaced the defect with bone. What if we just leave the defect empty? Like how good are these things at repairing tissue? So this is a rat model where we create what we call a critical defect. This defect won't heal um, at all. It's just too big of a defect for the body to heal. And instead of, so this would be a control animal or this is an animal that just had the defect created. And then what we did is we placed these cells on a particular scaffold in this case, it was demineralized bone uh, matrix. And you can see this beautiful union that happened. So where if we were to look at this um, defect without these cells, 84 days later, you would find no growth, no change. There'd be nothing here. But here we have beautiful union. So that was a pretty encouraging result. We also learned that the stem cells really need to be on something. They can't just be um, given in a site without being uh, stuck onto a scaffold of some kind. And the reason we think, so this just shows basically if you, the amount of new bone, if all you did was give the cells, you got a little bit of bone. If all you did was give the scaffold, which is what we stuck the cells on, but no cells, you got some more bone. But when you did the two together, you got a lot more bone and that's what created a union or, or defect. And then we also showed that we could find those cells later, that they the cells that were um, the ones that we actually transplanted in we could see that they had they had actually um, uh, differentiated into bone cells and other um, types of cells that were important for um, bone healing. So what we're showing here is the co-localization of the the immuno um, stain for the green fluorescent protein, and also that these guys have osteocalcin, which means they're bone cells. And we could see this happening in this case, the stain that we are identifying the stem cells with is red, but you can see that they were participating in all kinds of stages of the bone repair um, in um, even as uh, new blood vessels grew in. So these cells really are a very important part of doing that. And these cells were participating in that 
um, union of the cells that we saw on the rat model there um, in a lot of different stages of, of the bone healing. So I'm gonna switch gears from bone to muscle just for a few minutes, because this is really an interesting thing too. And again, it involves stem cells. Um, we talked a little bit about how muscle loss is a big problem. Um, and what happens is when you have enough of your skeletal muscle, this is the muscle that you know moves our bones and ligaments, et cetera, that's lost, we can't regenerate it and it results in a persistent de deficit. So we can't, we can't reform it. We can't really transplant enough tissue to reconstruct it from another place in the body. So it heals by fibrous scarring and this causes diminished function. So what we wanted to do was think about, okay, what if we were to think about a tissue engineering approach to create new muscle in a defect? And so we decided that the best way to do this might be to take muscle tissue that is from a tissue donor, take away all the cells because if you have cells in the tissue, it's gonna cause an immune response. So we wanted to get rid of all the cells. And then what if we could reseed cells on there, the right kind of cells to then make that muscle functional again. And this is kind of the approach that tissue engineering takes with many different things where we're using a scaffold cells and hopefully using the signaling that existed within that muscle tissue to help form muscle that was functional. So the first thing we wanted to do was take all the cells out. So we were, we were trying to figure out if we could remove all the cellular material from muscle and just remain with the scaffold. And that actually has been done on a lot of tissues. Um, this is actually a trachea. So this is a trachea from a person that donated their tissues to science. And then this is the removal of the cells. So you kind of can see the difference in color, but the most important thing that's happened here is that the cells have been removed, so there's no longer a chance that for that person to reject that, like an organ, like a kidney or something. This just becomes essentially an inactive scaffold, but hopefully what it retains is the signals that we need to help those stem cells direct what they're supposed to do. Now remember, stem cells are, need this signal and they need to be stuck to things, because if you think about stem cells, when you just put stem cells in randomly, they're sort of like the like teenagers that are sort of sitting on the couch trying to figure out what to do with their lives. They actually need some direction to do what we want them to do. And so we needed to make sure that we had the right signals in these tissues to give them direction. And then our concept was, okay, once we got rid of the cells, what if we then put these stem cells in there, relied on the, on the signals that were in the scaffold to begin with, and let that person's own stem cells repopulate that decellularized muscle, and then that would function. At least that was kind of the concept. And so we started studying this. And so the first thing we had to do was we had to successfully get rid of the cells in the muscle. Well, this turned out to be a really hard thing to do. Um, we were working with a, 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 a tissue um, um, bank called Allosource down at Centennial. We're using, or using uh, human muscle from um, people who had become donors. And we were um, playing around with different techniques. And this was a lot of our first work resulted in a lot of mush at the bottom of a, of a beaker. But eventually we got there where we could get rid of all the cells and not have an, any you know, cells left. And we still maintain the integrity of the structure of the muscle, which is what we were after. And then we started again in the rat to figure out if this would be something we could do that would then move into larger animals like dogs and people. So we created this muscle defect in the muscles of rats, and we compared muscles that had no reconstruction, muscles that just had the muscle scaffold with no cells. And then we also put in cells, which we called our reanimated scaffold. Um, we put cells in there and um, onto the scaffold. And then we looked and saw what happened over about a four month period. Now these rats did really well after surgery, they could run around, they didn't have any exercise restriction. They were allowed to move around and eat and do and play and, um, and everything. And at the end of four months, we just looked to see what their muscle function is. And you can see this little video here, we're trying to look at a, a muscle twitch here. So you can see, if you look right here, you'll see that muscle contraction there. And what we're trying to figure out is how much uh, contraction can that muscle um, do? And we're comparing the muscle force that could be generated between um, muscles that either had no repair or muscles that had just the scaffold with no cells and then muscles that had the reanimated scaffold. And then we did a bunch of histologic scoring and other things. Oh no, this didn't, oh, didn't come out. Well, let me kind of describe to you what this graph is supposed to be showing. So what we learned, what we did is um, 
we looked at muscle recovery and we compared it to the opposite limb, which did not have surgery. And so everything below what this would have been was zero line is loss of function. This green was, um, there was no, no, no reconstruction. So we just created the defect, didn't do anything, let it heal by scar tissue. The amount of muscle contraction that that could do was much less. So this is everything below zero. And um, just the scaffold alone, maybe a little bit of improvement, but you can see we recovered in this case, 85% of function. So this is close to where we, close to how the opposite limb did. And I'm sorry about the graph not coming through on this particular background, um, but we were able to recover, oh, sorry, 97% of function in this particular measurement um, to, to make, to, with, with the reanimated muscle or the reanimated scaffold. So really hugely successful and encouraging. And so then of course, our next step was to bring this into the dog and that's where we are currently. So I think that this kind of just gives you a bit of some ideas of how we can take some of these things from a concept, prove that it works in terms of uh, proof of concepts in, in, in our rat patients or rat animals, um, small animals like that, and then utilizing dogs that already have the need for something like this, um, hopefully move that to get more evidence to move that into people. And, um, and I would say that that's kind of, I guess, uh, were we Did we do this last time, Ryan? I'll, you have to remind me, but one of the things I, I think that um, that I want to emphasize about this is that there's a lot of, there are a lot of people that um, suffer from limb loss. And I do think that because of this, um, we are um, providing hope and not just to our canine patients, but um, to human patients as well. And, and we're going to continue to do that um, and continue to work toward moving the needle and making uh, amputation something of the past. So I'll stop sharing there and see if there are questions. We did have one uh, so far. It is, is there research happening to discover other materials besides metal for both human and dogs that might respond better? Yes, um, thanks for that question. Um, yes, and, and so, you know, this is a, this kind of, goes into a lot more than I had time to do. But yeah, there's all different kinds of things that people are looking at. Things that are like coral type um, materials, um, other um, polymer type materials that have similar um, mechanical properties as bone. Um, and then there's even these things called um, porous metals that behave a little bit more like bone in terms of uh, biomechanics also have pores where tissue can kind of grow into them. So it's a huge area of research and metal and, and um, grafted bone is only two areas. We've done a lot more even with like putting nano surfaces on metal and putting nano surfaces on grafted bone um, that encourage the body's own tissues to move in there and, and replace it and repair it kind of what our goal is. So all of that is, is actually ongoing currently and here at CSU, but also elsewhere, many people working on that. And if anyone else has any questions, I can unmute people, allow you to talk if that's easier if you don't wanna type. But right now I don't have any other questions listed. Um, let's see here. Here we go. How widespread do you think companion dogs have the ability to be used? And will researchers dislike moving away from rats? Will they dislike moving away from rats? Um, well, it's been a battle to help kind of the real, you know, hardcore mouse and rat people to understand the benefit of um, the companion dog and how that can help move the technology and discovery forward. I think what bothers them about it is that there's so much heterogeneity between dogs, but that's better mimicking of people. So I don't ever see that dogs will replace mice because mice, there's advantages, not only just to the transgenic op options in mice, where you can actually genetically like program them to do certain things or have certain diseases or have, you know, ways in which you can look at mechanisms. But I, so I, I don't see that as ever going away. Um, but this is kind of that next step. It's really a bridge between going from mouse to man. We know that experiments um, and technologies and discoveries that try to go directly from mouse to man fail more than 90% of the time. And, and the other thing is if you're just using an induced animal model like 
when we were creating a defect or creating infection, as we mentioned earlier, it doesn't really always mimic the natural disease. These are naturally occurring things that happen in dogs and they need the treatment anyway. So because of that, it, there's a very powerful opportunity. I think it has taken some convincing because people kind of have been ensconced in this paradigm of mouse to man for so long, but I think we're making a ton of headway. And of course, in the meantime, we're helping dog patients, which is, which is always really great, so. And then Max has another question. Um, are you also using, I think this is electric stim with muscle development yeah. functions? Yeah, um, no, not in this, these particular experiments, um, but there are all different types of strategies that people are using to encourage um, building of muscle that's starting to be regenerated. One thing that's kind of an exciting area is we're, being, we're doing a pretty good job of being able to re, re, uh, construct muscle and kind of reanimate the muscle using these stem cells. Um, but um, we're not that good at repairing the nerve, um, the nerve uh, integration into that. That's been a challenge. And so people have been really interested in what signals will create, um, what, what can we add to this concept that then would allow these neurons or nerve, baby nerves that are healing to actually innervate that area. What we're relying on currently is that the surrounding tissue can do some of that for us and it kind of gets trained over time, but it's really kind of an arduous process. And honestly, when we get to the largest defects, we're not as good at it for the reason that we just mentioned is we just don't have the innervation that is required to make that muscle function normally. And then Diana has one, uh, is stem cell therapy just a precursor to the work that you're doing or are, there, are they even related? Yeah, um, it's a great question, Diana. Stem cell, the, the term stem cell therapy is used for a lot of different, um, things that people are doing. Stem cell therapy can be related, can be um, something that people say you use for like a platelet derived plasma or platelet enriched plasma. Like there's a million things. So the word stem cell therapy is a catch all that people use and it doesn't mean the same thing every time. We are actually using stem cell therapy. That's, that's remember those stem cells, those mesenchymal stem cells are being used to help reconstruct the the tissues that we just talked about. So that is a form of stem cell therapy. The type of stem cell therapy that's clinically available, like you see paper ads for in the paper or like in airline magazines, when we all used to fly on airlines, um, you know, that is typically not the same exact thing. So what I would share with you is if you have an interest in stem cell therapy for yourself or a loved one, please, please, please do your research. There's a lot of the wild west out there. They're charging huge amounts of money and some of it's a lot of not very effective, but there, there's a huge amount of promise with stem cell therapy. It's just that we need to understand how to use the tool and we're getting there, like we really are. And this is one tool, one way in which we're using stem cell therapy that we think we've got a pretty good handle on. Cheryl has another one in regards to stem cell. It's, she asked, is it, being used in humans at this time versus animals? Is it being kind of the same as humans and animals? Are we talking about the specific uh, technique I was sh sharing earlier or just stem cell therapy in general? Um, she just says how much stem cell is being used in humans at the time, at this time versus animals. Oh, so, okay. Sorry, I um, wrong. That's okay. Um, yeah, well, it's being used pretty widely in both species, to be honest. Um, and some in both species that there, there are times where I think it's not necessarily appropriately used. Um, so again, just be cautious, but it is definitely um, it is definitely something that's being widely used in both humans and uh, canines and horses. And Max, he said that it they use it with so many hamstring injuries in the chat there. Uh, maybe, maybe Max didn't have time to finish his question. Yeah. It is a, po they, do, they do have a potent anti-inflammatory effect. So some people are using them in athletic injuries to help um, speed up healing. Um, they actually uh, can do a pretty good job there in acute injuries. As, um, and there, there's, it depends on the type of stem cell therapy you're getting because sometimes it's, 
it's from fat, sometimes it's from bone marrow, sometimes there's no cells in it at all, but people still call it stem cell therapy. So, you know, that's why I, I would be very cautious to understand what you're actually receiving if you're interested in receiving stem cell therapy. He says, yes, Great question. Are, yeah, okay. Are they using them in human muscle strains? Um, yes, and so yeah, uh, like for athletes, um, for acute injuries and in athletes to help decrease the amount of time they have to be out. They have been using stem cell type therapies in those as well. All right, anybody else have any questions for Dr. Earhart? see. All right. Well, I think that's it. I just want to say thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. If you want to hear more about her research that she's doing with COVID-19, I'll put in the chat uh, her upcoming event. It's going to be November 10th, where she'll be speaking more about diagnostics and testing on COVID-19. Um, if you do want to share this with other uh, friends and family, uh, in the upcoming week, we'll upload this on YouTube and it'll be able to be viewed at later times. But if we don't have any other questions, I think that is it for tonight. I just wanna say thank you for everyone for coming and thank you, Nicole Earhart for this. I, it was eye-opening and very interesting on, on all Great. the research you're doing. So thank you so much. Fantastic, thank you all. Thanks for your attention and I look forward to seeing you at a next alumni event.